much. Thank you very much for the organizers for the invitation to participate on this uh, workshop. Uh, today, I'd like to tell you about some uh, recent results uh, in collaboration with uh, mainly with Daniel Sudarsky and also with uh, Edward Wilson Ewing. And I just realized that this is uh, I should have included uh, here also um, uh, James Bjorken. Uh, this is just a typo which has to do with the, the things that I'm going to tell at the beginning. So um, we have been studying possible implications of, uh, of the uh, planking discreteness that is predicted by several approaches to quantum gravity. Uh, of course, I am very much influenced by the perspective of loop quantum gravity, but I think uh, most of the discussion that we're going to have uh, is meant to be more general and to be applicable to other approaches because it's going to be essentially phenomenology based on things we think uh, describe the physics as the fundamental scale. So to begin, so in physics we often use idealizations, mathematical descriptions of uh, nature in terms of uh, smooth fields or smooth uh, degrees of freedom of a reality that we might know it's described at the fundamental level by discrete variables. An example of that is for is uh, Navier Stokes theory for fluids that we know describes very well uh, fluids at a given at, at large scales, but uh, we know fluids are made of, of molecules. And so this such description is bound to break down when we go down to the molecular scales. Similarly, uh, we believe from several approaches to quantum gravity that general re relativity might be uh, a similar example. Namely, that the description of fields, of matter fields living on a smooth mat uh, manifold, space-time manifold, is only an approximation of an underlying fundamentally discrete uh, physics. So in both cases, or in, or in, in generically, when one has effective description in terms of smooth fields of a nature that is fundamentally discrete, one generic effect that we expect to be present is the phenomenon of diffusion, which leads to an effective violation of energy conservation. So in the case of Navier-Stokes theor uh, theory, energy is not conserved because it can flow into the molecular chaos or uh, as I represent in this uh, cartoon, in all our description of macroscopic physics, we know that energy encoded in macroscopic variables is not conserved because of the presence of friction and diffusion. Similarly, I will try to argue that such uh, diffusion should be expected in the context of general relativity or an effective description of, uh, of gravity and coupled to matter fields because of the underlying Planckian structure. And I will try to argue that one of the generic phenomen, uh, phenomenological manifestations of such diffusion, namely an effective violation of energy conservation, that I will describe in more details, is the emergence of dark energy. And that is, uh, okay. So first of all, let me tell, let me briefly remind you of the cosmological constant problem, at least in the context of quantum field theory, one often refers to the cosmological constant problem to the problem that when one computes in quantum field theory the vacuum of expectation values of the or expectations values of, of the energy momentum tensor in the vacuum, one finds that vacuum fluctuations contribute enormously to uh, a term in the energy momentum tensor which is here that is proportional to the metric that acts as dark energy or as the cosmological constant. And the problem is that this term is actually divergent, so you kind of naively estimate it by putting, putting a, a cutoff. If you put a cutoff at the Planck scale, then you find something that is way too large in comparison with the value of the cosmological constant that we observe. 10 to the 120 times larger than what you would expect. And this is referred to the cosmological constant problem often, often but of course, the problem is a question about quant of quantum gravity. So the, 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 the problem is, is phrased here in, ter in terms of quantum field theory tools. But of course, if we talk about um, a 
cosmological constant or dark energy, we're talking about the coupling of these quantum fluctuations with the geometry. So it's a question about gravity and it's a question about how does the vacuum gravitate. It's actually a question for quantum gravity. And uh, there, are, there is a very simple trivialization of the cosmological constant problem that uh, has to do, that can be done in terms of very simple modifications of general relativity. Uh, in fact, modifications of general relativity that were introduced by Einstein already in uh, more than 100 years ago. Is there a question? Sorry. Oh, I don't know. That was some okay. unclear so, sound. So we will see that the presence of, um, we will talk about the possibility of violating energy conservation, namely that the divergence of T mu nu be different from zero. So here you see the usual formulations of general relativity, the standard formulation in the first line and the introduction of the cosmological constant later. In both cases, Bianchi identities imply that divergence of T mu nu must be zero. So you cannot have diffusion in the standard formulation of general relativity. However, in 1919, Einstein introduced a different version of a gravity theory, which is today known as unimodular gravity. Equations of motion in the equations of unimodular gravity are given by the trace-free part of Einstein's equations, which if in addition you assume that the energy momentum tensor is conserved, then, as we will see in a moment explicitly, this theory is completely equivalent to general relativity, except for the fact that the cosmological constant arises as a constant of integration. But this theory is much better from the perspective of the cosmological constant problem that we just evoked, because in unimodular gravity, a tensor uh, that is pure trace, like the contribution to the energy momentum tensor from vacuum fluctuations just does not gravitate because it does not appear in the field equations which only involve the trace-free part. And this is a point that was uh, emphasized by uh, Weinberg at the late 80s already. So there is no vacuum energy problem, cosmological constant problem in unimodular gravity. So this is an interesting and attractive aspect of unimodular gravity. And we'll come back to, and we'll see how unimodular gravity is actually even more attractive for the following reason. So we said that with the assumption that energy momentum is conserved, then unimodular gravity is just equivalent to general relativity. We'll see that explicitly in a moment. But what happens if we, if we lose this second ingredient? So if energy momentum conservation is, is if the ingredient two is lost, then unimodular gravity becomes a natural generalization of general relativity as an open system, as a system where there is an environment to which energy can flow and therefore ingredient number two doesn't hold. And this is exactly the kind of thing we would like to have if we want to have an effective low energy description that takes into account the fact that at the microscopic level, there could be uh, there are discrete degrees of freedoms which are not accounted for in the smooth description of general relativity. And therefore, the reasons for the yeah. energy would be lost. And that is something that should be independent of your favorite approach to quantum gravity, as long as you believe that at the Planckian, at the fundamental level, discrete or that the metric and the smooth uh, fields do not suffice to describing, for describing the physics at the fundamental level. So in other words, with this uh, picture here, I, like, I try to, to emphasize this. If at the, plan if at the Planckian level, so, so one thing I should have said here, see the reason why T mu is conserved is related to the mathematical level to the covariance of general relativity to diffeomorphism invariance, but at the physical level, one can say that it is actually related, and this is precise. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's the physical description of, of the mathematical result to the fact that in general relativity, space-time is moved to all scales, and so we can approximate space-time in a very in a local uh, around the point by the tangent space. The tangent space has the ten isometries of Minkowski space-time, uh, Poincaré invariance, and the, the, the 
conservation law, laws associated to these uh, isometries of the tangent space are all, you know, encoded in the conservation of the energy momentum tensor. If quantum gravity is such that the notion of a tangent space doesn't exist, namely if at the microscopic level we don't have a smooth geometry to begin with, we lose Poincaré invariance and we lose we lose the rational for expecting uh, uh, the conservation of the energy momentum tensor. Of course, we are not talking about energy being destroyed or created in any magical way. We are talking about uh, the fact that an effective description that does not take into account all the degrees of freedom necessarily, like uh, uh, like Navier Stokes theory, necessarily we lose some of the degrees of freedoms that could carry energy. And therefore, uh, diffusion will be at place. So let me go back to unimodular gravity. Those, these are the trace free Einstein's equations that I can reorganize in this way where I have introduced the Einstein tensor here. Now, if you use Bianchi identities, then this equation becomes that this one where, where we have a relationship between the divergence of the energy momentum tensor and the gradient of this combination of scalars, the scalar curvature and the trace of the energy momentum tensor. Now, if you assume that the divergence of T mu nu is not zero because of what of the phenomenology that we want to, to, to describe. And as long as this current J of uh, violations of energy momentum conservation satisfies this integrability condition, then you can integrate this equation and replace the result of the integration back into the previous equation to obtain these equations, which are which look like Einstein's equations, standard Einstein's equations, except for the fact that in there is a dark energy component which is given by a constant of integration lambda zero plus an integral of this current of energy momentum violation. So this tells us that unimodular gravity, in the context of unimodular gravity, if we have diffusion, if we have a violation of energy momentum conservation, the energy we lose or gain will modify. So the energy we lose would feed a dark energy term in the effective Einstein's equations. But aside from that, unimodular gravity, the rest, so aside from the dark energy sector, the rest is just equivalent to general relativity. So unimodular gravity, let me say a few words about unimodular gravity. Unimodular gravity emerges, actually, is a very natural theory emerging as a low energy limit in arguments that have been around for some time, which are quite known, like su such as uh, uh, Jacobson's, Jacobson's argument of uh, um, obtaining Einstein's equations from thermodynamic arguments, uh, both the old and the new version, they lead to the trace-free Einstein's equations. And in fact, so uh, uh, the, the, the low energy uh, effective theory that emerges from it is actually unimodular gravity, not general relativity, which as you've seen, uh, there is a very small, there's very, very little subtlety that differentiates the two. Also, it is the formulation that emerges naturally uh, in formulations to quantum gravity where the underlying uh, description of geometry is based on four-dimensional, where, where the notion of 4D discrete building blocks makes invariant sense uh, at the fundamental level. And one example of that is Sorkin's causal sets approach. In unimodular gravity, uni uh, diffeomorphisms are mildly broken. They are broken down to volume preserving diffeomorphisms and this is the reason why divergence of T mu nu need not be zero. Remember there is a way of proving that divergence of T mu nu must be zero from the action if the action is invariant under diffeomorphisms. The action of unimolar gravity is invariant only under volume preserving diffeomorphism. Unimolar gravity is also the natural semi-classical theory when you study the normalization of the energy momentum tensor on curved space time. When you subtract divergences uh, back, uh, zero point divergences in the renormalization of the energy momentum tensor, what happens is that quantum effects induce um, a diffeo anomaly, a divergence of T mu nu uh, that you get rid of by subtracting, by redefining the energy momentum tensor, by subtracting a term that is independent of the state. When you do that for a a conformally invariant field, you introduce this, uh, what is called the trace anomaly because you have introduced an anomalous trace to the otherwise trace free, uh, in initially trace free uh, energy momentum tensor of a conformally invariant field. Now, 
If you don't do that last step, then you have an energy momentum tensor that does not satisfy uh, the conservations. So its divergence is equal to the gradient of something that is independent of is state independent. You can stay there. If you accept that anomaly, then you could use instead of general relativity, unimodular gravity as your effective equations. Uh, field equations, and the statement is that if you do that, you obtain exactly the same dynamics for the metric as if you would have re uh, subtracted the trace to obtain a divergence free T mu nu. So the most economic path is not to do this last step, and the whole physics is equivalent. So, what I want to say, we often say that quantum fluctuations introduce a trace anomaly in the case of. Uh, of um, of um, conformal invariant fields, we can equally say that quantum fields introduce a DFU anomaly, a violation of energy momentum conservation. And if we use unimodular gravity to treat the dynamics of the of the metric, then uh, the, uh, then uh, all conclusions will be in agreement. So, as I said before, in unimodular gravity, vacuum fluctuations do not gravitate. There is no vacuum energy contribution to the cosmological constant. And so apart, finally, very importantly, apart from differences in the dark energy sector, unimodular gravity is equivalent to general relativity. It passes all the tests of GR. It has two local degrees of freedom, all the gravitational wave data. Everything would be fit by unimodular gravity equally well as with general relativity. And this is emphasized in several places, but in particular in this article. OK, so. <clears throat> Now, we want to use unimodular gravity because it allows us to describe uh, uh, diffusion into the Planckian environment. So what one would like to have is a model, a way of, of estimating uh, the amount of diffusion introduced by the fact that nature is discrete at the Planck scale. So the question is, can we predict this current? Can we calculate this current? And if we can, then we can see what would be the contribution to dark energy coming from this mechanism. And the answer is yes. So we in in this series of articles, we have produced a model which I would like to briefly describe now and whose result I want to present. So first of all, the discreteness we're talking about cannot be something like the discreteness you can visualize uh, as you know, being there at rest in some reference frame as a lattice, underlying lattice on top of which things uh, live. This is inconsistent with low energy data, as uh, as it has been pointed out uh, some time ago. If you violate, because this violates Lorentz invariance, if you violate Lorentz invariance at the fundamental scale, then rate, and if you have interactions in your uh, in your matter fields then loop corrections or radiative corrections enhance, generically enhance these Lorentz violations and produce Lorentz violating terms in your effective action at low energies that are not suppressed by the Planck mass and they are only suppressed by the couplings of, say, the standard model. So you would get large Lorentz violations that we do not observe in uh, our particle physics experiments. So. Oops. So the discreteness we're talking about has to be quantum gravity discreteness uh, that has a relational nature as anything that we believe is observable in quantum gravity. Now there is a loophole to the previous argument. The previous argu argument is done on a space time that is assumed to be at large uh, scales at low energies, uh, Minkowski space time. If you have you could have Lorentz violation, Lorentz violating terms due to discreteness that are uh, suppressed by curvature or that are uh, uh, mediated by curvature. And in that case, certainly when you go to the low energy flat Minkowski space time, then these terms will disappear because they will be uh, uh, so the, the, because they will be um, yeah because they are proportional to curvature. And in this cartoon. I like to give some some kind of a very heuristic um, uh, 
intuitive idea of what, what we have in mind. So you could imagine uh, a surface that is uh, made of tiles, and uh, when the surface is flat, then you are not aware of the discreteness, but when you try to, to produce curvature, then uh, the edges of the, of the tiles will become apparent and discreteness by manif ma ba uh, might manifest it itself. <clears throat> Sorry, may I ask a question? Um, yes. So do you also have like a relative notion of locality, as in relative locality? Or? I think I, I don't, I don't have any of, I don't need to invoke uh, 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 relative locality or relative notions of, of locality. People have argued that such a thing could emerge from this underlying discrete uh, 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 description in, at the fundamental level. And uh, I, I don't need to invoke these things for, for, the, for, the, for the model I want to construct. But I, yeah, but you uh, just mean you have some relative notion of locality as well. I don't need to talk about it. Okay. So I, <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to commit to a relative notion of locality. And uh, even though people think that this might be something important, and I don't want to say this is a bad idea, but I don't need to commit to, to it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So the basic idea is that uh, uh, geometry in general relativity already is something that makes sense only when we have the use of to prove to prove it, right? When we there is no way of giving a, a invariant meaning of the components of the metric tensor in general relativity. Uh, the notion of geometry uh, emerges as an observable quantity only when you have appropriate degrees of freedom to prove it. In general relativity, we often invoke uh, test observers, and this is why many things become very easy. Of course, in quantum gravity, it's much more complicated, but the key is that we believe that, I mean, anything that makes sense will have to be constructed out of such things, which are what we call mathematically Dirac observables. So gauge invariant quantities that, that are constructed out of relationship between geometric, geometry and probing degrees of freedom. And I represent this by this cartoon that, uh, uh, that reminds us that when we talk about space-time geometry, we need to think of clocks and roads to probe it. So we believe that discreteness, therefore discreteness, the discreteness that we are in invoking here has to be something that makes sense only in terms of the degrees of freedoms that probe the geometry. It's not the discreteness that is sitting there uh, and that can be described independently of the degrees of freedom that uh, probe the geometry. And from this perspective, if we think of the analogy with clocks and roads, then the degrees of freedoms that naturally will be most sensitive to this discreteness must be degrees of freedom that carry themselves a ruler. So these are degrees of freedoms that break scale invariance. In other words, we expect a photon not to be primarily sensitive to uh, the discrete, discreteness because a photon cannot define by itself a preferred rest frame where the Planck scale will make an, have an invariant meaning. However, if we think of a massive scalar field or a massive uh, field, then an excitation of a massive field then defines by itself its own rest frame respect to which the discreteness scale can make an invariant sense. This is similar to the introduction, introduction of a scale in a, in a, in a massive uh, theory. You might say, how can you have a scale in a Lorentz invariant theory? Uh, how can you have an energy scale in Lorentz invariant uh, theory? Of course, the, the answer is very trivial. We know that the mass in a Klein-Gordon field means energy of, it means the rest energy of an excitation of the field. So it is the field, that is the excitation of the field that selects a preferred rest frame with respect to which the mass acquires the uh, 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 acquires an invariant notion, uh, appears as an invariant notion of energy, the rest energy of the excitation. Similarly, scale breaking degrees of freedom can also uh, be sensitive to or define this discreteness that we are talking about with respect to their own um, rest frame that an excitation of the field would define. Therefore, scale breaking the use of freedom should be primarily 
should be the primary probes of the discreteness that, that we are talking about and should be the, 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 the degrees of freedoms that are most exposed to the diffusion that we want to describe. And a natural order parameter to describe the presence of these degrees of freedoms is the scalar curvature, because the scalar curvature is proportional to the trace of the energy momentum tensor, which is exactly vanishing for scale invariant fields such as electromagnetic waves. So the presence of the, the degrees of freedoms that primarily can diffuse is signaled by the scalar curvature. So we expect massive field fields, therefore, to be those which are exposed to this diffusion effect. And so we want to parameterize it in a, a phenomenological way. More or less in the way we parameterize friction, you know, at low energies, uh, we were able to parameterize friction well before we understood the details of uh, the microscopic physics of molecules. So we want to write, so in, we're going to do an apply, application to cosmology. So imagine we are in a friedman rong zawocki cosmology. Here you have a cartoon picture where uh, the vector, the red vector field here represents the co-moving observers, those that move with the galaxies. And now imagine a test particle, well, a particle that moves with four velocity, with arbitrary four velocity, u. So this is an otherwise free particle. Free particles move along geodesics. Now we want to postulate that there is a frictional force. There is a force due to the fact that these particles could be sensitive or would be sensitive to the underlying discrete degrees of freedoms. And we want to parameterize this force via first its acceleration. So we're going to write the acceleration. The acceleration will be given by this expression here. So it has to be proportional to the scalar curvature from the idea that scale invariant matter does not suffer nor sources friction. So only matter that is at the source that, that, that contributes to a non-trivial scalar curvature should, appear, should be um, uh, affected by this force. Now, the force has to be orthogonal to the acceleration and the only uh, intrinsic direction that the particle has that is always orthogonal to its four velocity is its spin. So the force has to be proportional to the spin. The rest comes from dimensional analysis. The rest, except for this little term here, which is the only thing that actually violates Lorentz invariance, as you see, it is dependent on, the, on this background field, which represents the mean motion of the environmental matter. So this term is just the sign of this inner product between the spin and uh, the vector field psi. And this term is what makes this force a friction-like force. And to see that, you just compute the way in which the energy of the particle changes with proper time. This is this equation down here. And when you do that, you find, you find two terms. This last term is a term that would vanish if psi, the co-moving vector field, would be a killing field. Of course, in cosmology, it's not a killing field, but we know very well what this second term is. This second term is, is a term that tells us that the energy of the particle will change due to redshift because the universe is expanding. So this term, we know what it is. Now, the first term is the generally new term, and we see that it has a definite negative sign if alpha is positive. And by the way, alpha is the only parameter in the model it's a phenomenological parameter. If our model makes sense, we expect alpha to be order one when we confront its implications with observations. So this sign term is what makes this force a friction-like force, and this is what makes this equation the analog of a Langevin equation, where you introduce this term to describe the uh, effects, the low energy effects of the collisions of the Brownian motion, okay? the collisions with the molecules of a, of a Brownian particle. Okay, so uh, the tensor structure, the fact that we put the spin here can be, uh, I mean, as I said, is the only intrinsic, intrinsic direction that is orthogonal to U, and uh, this is what we need for a, for a relativistic uh, force. But I, I just very briefly, I want to, to, to make this. Uh, so, so the force which is constructed, which is basically made from dimensional analysis and the requirement 
the kinematical requirement that the, the force is orthogonal to, to, the, to you, together with our important assumption that only scale breaking the use of freedom will suffer the diffusion. Um, it's, Excuse it's, me, it's, there's uh, a question from Chun Shan. Yeah. Um, is this a scale invariance, uh, local symmetry or global symmetry? I'm talking about the local symmetry, local scale invariance. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the symmetry that leads to the vanishing of the trace of the energy momentum tensor. Okay, so it's a local one. Okay, yes. thank you. Okay, so what I was going to say is that this force acts non-trivially only, as you can see, only on massive, therefore scale breaking the use of freedom, but also spinning. If the particle is a scalar field, then the force will be zero. So you need massive and spinning degrees of freedom. And, uh, and, uh, uh, so, and this is why I'm drawing this picture. So if you, if you think of a scalar excitation, even if it breaks scale invariance, if it's massive, then a massive a, a scalar excitation is basically a one-dimensional probe of space-time because the only thing that a particle, a scalar particle, carries is its form momentum. It's, there is only the form momentum and we can represent it just as a world line in space-time, just a one-dimensional probe. Now, massless spinning excitations are 3D probes, like photons, because they are transverse. Uh, so we have the momentum, and then we have a transverse direction along which they have their uh, elicity. So massless spinning excitations are three-dimensional probes in space-time. None of the two would feel the friction-like force that we are constructing here. Only massive and spinning excitations, which are genuine four-dimensional probes. Why? Because they are given, they are represented in my cartoon by a tube. Why? Here is a ribbon because, I mean, of course we are dropping one dimension because we have the momentum and the transfer di direction that is being probed by the de degrees of freedom. Now for a massive spinning excitation, we have the four momentum and then the three sphere of possible directions in which the spin can be. So, and this is, this is nice because uh, if you think that space-time is made of four-dimensional grains, then only with four-dimensional props, or, or if it's made of grains of space, then it's natural that the primarily, uh, the, the props that will primarily be uh, exposed to the diffusion will be those that are four-dimensional props. And uh, these pictures correspond to this uh, tensor analysis that basically singles out. So you can write the most general force that is compatible with orthogonality with you by something that look like, uh, looks like an electromagnetic force. And then you can see all the tensors that you can write. And you see that the force we're postulating here is constructed with all ingredients which are intrinsic to the particle, this one, and we are discarding these two here. The fourth one can be added and nothing will change. And so I can make some comments about the other two also. But so as this force we are postulating according to dimensional analysis and the kinematics of, for, of force, uh, relativistic forces is essentially unique. In its leading contribution, of course, we could expect higher curvature corrections to that, but they will not be important in what I want to say later. So let me compare these equations with similar looking equations. So, to, so this equation is very similar to the papa petrov dixon equation that one finds when one considers the motion of macroscopic bodies, spinning bodies in curved space-time. It is also similar to, in structure to what you find uh, in the WKB approximation for fermions on curved space-times. And of course, what is special about it that is not present in the other two examples is the fact that this is non-conservative force, there is friction, and in that it is analogous to the Langevin equation. So now we have the force that acts on a test particle in, uh, in space-time. So from it, from this force that as we've seen for an individual particle does not conserve energy, we could now think of a box or think of an ensemble of such particles and compute the energy momentum tensor associated to the ensemble of particles. This is a simple exercise in relativistic kinetic theory. 
and then we can compute because for individual particles energy is not conserved it shouldn't be surprising that the divergence of t mu nu will not be zero due to this friction force and so a calculation in relativistic genetic theory tell us what this current of energy momentum violation looks like and the complete result is given here we are assuming that we are in thermal equilibrium because we're going to apply this to cosmology. So you see the temperature appear, appearing here, the scalar curvature, and this sum is a sum over species of your model, say the species of the standard model, and you find the magnitude of the spin of each of the species times the trace of the energy momentum that contributes to the trace of the energy momentum contribution of each of the species. And the current, not surprisingly, because of the symmetries of the Freeman Robinson Walker, space time is proportional to the, uh, the, the co moving frame field psi. So, for an estimate that I will uh, evoke in a moment, it's interesting to just simplify this. So, this is the exact uh, calculation, but you can, because um, the trace of the energy momentum tensor is proportional to the mass of the different species in the standard model, then this sum here is dominated, or, or the, the, the most important contribution to this comes from the top quark. And the top quark approximation then simplifies to something like this, where you find the temperature, the scalar curvature square. Okay. So this is just to make a quick estimate in what follows. So what the plan is now to compute the contribution to dark energy from this diffusion mechanism. The point is that in the standard model of cosmology and assuming the standard model of particle physics, until the electroweak transition, there are no spinning massive fields. So the current would be zero all the way up to the electroweak transition. Only at the electroweak transition, particles with mass and spin first appear and the diffusion mechanism can start being effect effective. So that means that the current is zero before, and so you have a contribution, you have a starting time for this integral here. So you start from the electroweak transition to today, and what you find is a value of the contribution to the cosmological constant, which is exactly of the order of magnitude of what we observe. And why is it exact? What you have to do this calculation is, is not very complicated, but I'm not giving you all the details, but if you use this top quark approximation, Still, you need to write the scalar curvature in the standard model of cosmology and do a little calculation. But believe me that when you do this integral here, you find that the contribution to lambda goes like the top quark mass to the fourth times the temperature of the electroweak transition to the third divided by mass Planck to the seven times m Planck square. And because the Planck, uh, the, the top quark mass is of the same order of magnitude as, as the electroweak transition temperature then you get basically the natural value of the cosmological constant times this factor, which is the temperature electric transition divided by the mass of the Planck mass to the seven, which is of the order of 10 to the minus 120. And this is why the contribution from this mechanism leads to an, a result that is of the right order of magnitude, what we actually observe. So in fact, there was an alpha in the model that I should have put here. Uh, so if you do the precise calculation used without the top quark approximation, you can plot the value of alpha that you would need. This is the dimensionless uh, parameter in our model that you would need in order to fit the observational data as a function of the temperature of, electric, of the electric transition. I am assuming that we don't know exactly what the electric transition temperature is. We know that it's of the order of 100 uh, giga electron volts. So here you see a plot that if the temperature of electric transition changes, then you need to adjust alpha to different values to fit the data. But all the values of alpha are always order one. And this is why our model is successful. In the, this is the sense in which the model is successful. Here you see that at the electroweak transition, here the, the plot is of lambda divided by lambda observed. So lambda is zero before the electroweak transition. That's by assumption and I will comment on this in a moment. And at the electric transition, electric transition, the diffusion mechanism starts and the cosmological constant grows very rapidly and to the value of, to the observed value. And then it keeps growing because the diffusion does not go away, but the current 
j, so the diffusion rate, goes to zero very, very rapidly because, remember, it was proportional to the scalar curvature square. So as the universe expands, this becomes very quickly, this goes to zero very quickly, and this is why the, this changing dark energy term quickly settles to something that is virtually a cosmological constant of the right order of magnitude. But there was an assumption in all this. It is that the assumption is that the constant of integration here was initially zero. And so that basically that the cosmological constant before the electrovic transition was vanishing. Before we observe a small value of the cosmological constant, people thought that the cosmological constant was actually zero. And there are plenty of different arguments for which that were constructed out of different, in particular, invoking symmetries and uh, other mechanisms to justify that the cosmological constant should actually be zero before. So sometimes people talk about two, two aspects of the cosmological constant problem. Why, one is it, why is it that it's uh, not huge? Uh, why is it that it's basically zero or very close to zero? And why is it that it has a very particular value? So the discussion that we had so far explains, it would explain why it has this very particular value if we assume that it was zero initially. But believe me, this very same diffusion, okay, believe me, I mean, work in progress, which I, I, I'm very excited about, and I think it's uh, very uh, 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 promising, shows that the very same diffusion that I am talking about here that is effective at the electroweak transition, when we talk about matter degrees of freedom, could also make the cosmological constant that would be at the Big Bang of the order of the Planck scale relax to zero before the electroweak transition. And the mechanism would be very similar to the one I'm telling you here, except that instead of being a diffusion from matter to the underlying discreteness, it would be a diffusion from the geometry to there that would be effective only at very, very high curvatures around the Planck uh, scale uh, close to uh, the Big Bang. So this is work in progress and I expect to be able to report on this soon. So finally, uh, um, there is a question from Michal Artemovsky. Yes. yes. So I have a quick question. I wonder, do you have to assume anything about the thermal history of the universe from the Planck scale to today? Because like more or less around electron around uh, electric phase transition, we are not really sure what was the content of the energy density. And in principle, energy density could be like, I don't know, six orders of magnitude bigger than we think. And uh, I wonder, could it have any influence on this mechanism? Uh, I am assuming that the electric transition happens at a given temperature. Uh, and but I do you assume a, anything am, about, am, let's say, other fields that are filling the universe or energy density no, no, of the no, universe? That's right, that's right. No, no, you're right. No, no, I am assuming the standard model. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I am assuming that basically the particles of the standard model is all there is from yeah. reheating to the electroweak transition. If yeah, you yeah, change, yeah, yeah. If you change that, then things could be uh, modified, but it depends how you change that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But in the calculation I'm, I'm showing you assumes that uh, we have inflation. So before yes. reheating, we only have an inflaton field, which is a scalar field, and therefore there is no diffusion. And after reheating, uh, we have, uh, you know, the particles yeah, of the sure, sun sure. in thermal equilibrium. So, yeah. so I just want to tell you that there are several inflationary models where the inflaton keeps dominating the evolution of the universe after inflation, uh -huh. and the effective reheating happens very late. And around electroweak phase transition, the energy density of the universe can be very, very high, much higher than we think. And this is still consistent with the data. It's, you can still satisfy BBN constraint with that. So I just want to say that it's not obvious that this scenario is, uh, is true, that the, that the standard model is all it is. From, okay. From, uh, okay, so it will be interesting to test whether uh, our model uh, you know, gives the same result in those, in those situations. Okay. Uh, uh, so I, I would like to know in more details. This, yeah, we, this we can talk later. It's, it's... Okay. Thank you. All right. So, of course, in the, the in the last part of the talk, I want to talk about the, a, a, a more, more uh, an additional 
speculative aspect of all this uh, that has to do with the recent history of the universe and aims at uh, perhaps resolving the HC rotation, the fact that there is a mismatch between because the, the Hubble rate today inferred from uh, the Planck data and the assumption of uh, lambda CDM from the CMB times to today and the local measurements of the Hubble rate. So, uh, but it, already in this picture here, you see that the diffusion mechanism that we invoked here that comes from quantum gravity and acting, uh, producing a, a friction on particles from the standard model will, will have nothing to do about the recent history of the universe because this creates a cosmological constant of the right order of magnitude, but then nothing happens. So there are absolutely no effects of this mechanism uh, in recent history because the diffusion is way too small because remember it is proportional to scalar curvature square and the universe has grown too much. So is there the possibility of getting a, a late change of the cosmological constant, the type of change that you would need at this is uh, low redshifts in order to try to contribute to the discussion of the H0 tension. And so uh, I want to show that, I mean, it seems like the, if the cosmological constant will change via a diffusion mechanism of the type I discussed in the first part, then it seems that we could actually resolve this H0 tension. But of course, one would need a new mechanism for, uh, one would need a new diffusion channel so what is it that now that is allowing for energy from the matter sector to flow into the Planckian regime uh, and so make the cosmological constant change? What is, it that, what, is, what is it that is happening here that did not happen from the electroweak transition until the uh, uh, CMB times? And what we think is a natural possibility is that this channel is opened by the existence of black holes. So here, from the CMB on, structure starts forming, stars appear, and black holes appear for the first time, perhaps for the first time if there are no primordial black holes. And if black holes are spinning, and uh, we argue in this, in this article that one could have a very small diffusion force that will slow down black holes in addition to other effects. So if, if, uh, if this, uh, if this um, speculations are correct, there is a whole variety of phenomenology associated to this, but there is a lot of uh, rotational energy uh, in, um, uh, carried by, by these black holes, which we expect uh, generically to form with high spins from astrophysical reasons. And therefore, if the diffusion uh, force will slow them down, there is a lot of, there is a huge reservoir of energy that could feed a growth, a late growth of the cosmological constant. And so, so the idea that a force similar to the one that we constructed for fundamental particles could be actually present for black holes and that this could lead to a slow down of the spinning rate of black holes in, in times of the order of billion years for a solar massive black hole. So it would be a very slow slowing down in, 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 in terms of obs direct observational uh, observation of, of black holes but it will be very rapid in terms of cosmological scales. So in order to explore that, we just constructed a few models in which energy flows from the matter degrees of freedom into the cosmological constant via mechan the mechanism that I already described um, for the electroweak transition. So here we don't have uh, a fundamental description. The fundamental description, we have some hints of what that would be when we talk about these black holes but having a precise way in which the cosmological constant change will require knowing exactly how many black holes are produced and with what, what spin as a function of redshift during the phase of structure formation. And this is something that we do, at least uh, myself and collaborators, we, we don't know yet. I mean, it would be very nice to, to find people to talk about this and, and, and see if we can uh, construct a model that is more precise, taking into account what, what is known. So here we just propose that the cosmological constant grows, for example, because of a sudden transfer of energy from raw matter, dark matter, uh, dark matter, think of dark matter, to lambda. 
So this picture contains the, the idea. So at, at, at large Z, you have raw matter that decays in the standard way. At some Z star, there is a transfer of energy to the cosmological constant that is very sudden and we describe here by a jump. Okay, this is not meant to be realistic. It's just meant to explore whether such a very simple model that has only three free parameters can say something about the H0 tension, okay? I emphasize a realistic model, we need to model how this actually happens when black holes are produced and slowed down by the by the by the spinning uh, by the um, friction force. So here there are three parameters. When the jump happens, what was the value of the cosmological constant in the past? And alpha is how much basically energy is being shifted from one uh, component to the other. And so here you see that uh, uh, this is the, a plot that shows the results. So first here we fix lambda in the past to the observed value of the cosmological constant today. So, uh, so we have an initial cosmological constant of the order of what we observe today. And then you see here uh, <clears throat> in this plot, the line, the dotted line shows you the values of the parameters alpha and Z star. So when the thing happens and how much energy is transferred, that would completely resolve the, the H0 tension. And then the other contours represent the one sigma and two sigma regions. Uh, this is for a certain range of uh, uh, redshift, and this is for larger values of redshift. So we see that with this very simple model, we can actually resolve the H0 tension. Uh, and here, these are analogous plots in which we have uh, larger values of, of uh, redshift. Here again, we plot uh, things in Z star and alpha. Uh, there are three parameters here. We have fixed again the cosmological constant in the past to the observed value. And here you have another plot in which we fix alpha to a value that is uh, preferred from, from the previous plots and we plot in terms of the value of the cosmological constant in the past. So we, we see that the cosmological constant in the past could, you know, move and become even negative. Uh, and, and, and then we still can fit the uh, data, the local data, namely resolve the, the H0 tension. So this, yeah, so to tell you how do we resolve, so we are changing the cosmological evolution of the universe in the very la late phase here. So in order to make, to render compatible the CMB observations of Planck with the local observations and therefore obtain the same value of the H0 and eliminate the tension. So this is another model, a different model. It's similar to the other one, but it's instead of having a sudden transfer of energy up to some Z star, things are as usual. There is no friction, there is no transfer, no diffusion, no transfer of energy. And then at that Z star, from that Z, Z star on, we have friction that makes the cosmological constant grow and modifies the evolution of raw matter uh, <clears throat> uh, away from, uh, in an anomalous way. And this is parameterized by, again, when the thing happens, Z star, what was the value of the cosmological constant uh, initially, or so at infinity for large Z, and gamma, this parameter tell us that the evolution of uh, raw matter dark matter will be is an anomalous parameter that, that, that tell us how much we deviate from the one over a cube behavior or, or the one plus z to the cube behavior of uh, dark matter. And again, you see that this very simple model also can resolve the, cosmo the, the, the tension. Something I forgot to say is that because we are transferring energy from dark matter into the cosmological constant via this diffusion mechanism in unimolar gravity, the end value of the uh, of omega matter today is different from the one that you see at the CMB. And so, and this is encoded in the color codes here. So you see that in order to fit the H0, to eliminate the H0 tension, you have to be in this green region and green means omega matter of the order of 0 0.26, a little bit around 0 0.26. So which means that you have used up a portion of the matter density in dark matter, in, da, in dark matter, in, in matter, in fact, this includes baryons and, and dark matter. You have the diffusion mechanism has used up a, a portion of this um, energy density to, in, that has been fed into the cosmological constant in unimodal gravity. So you have lost, omega matter is lower today 
than it would be in Lambda CDM. Okay, so let me finish with a quick discussion of what we have, what I have mentioned. So violations of energy conservation in the effective smooth field description of general relativity can occur due to Brownian diffusion with the Planckian microscopic environment. Compatibility with Lorentz invariance leads to a precise and all essentially unique a description of the friction like force that I, I, I gave you for particles of the standard model and such pro this leads to diffusion that produces dark energy of uh, of the right order of magnitude it produces a contribution to dark energy which which matches the observed value uh, if after decoupling another channel is open, so the diffusion mechanism that leads to the cosmological constant at the electroweak transition cannot change anything about the late evolution of the universe, but if a, if a new mechanism is of diffusion is open, then this could have something to say about the H0 tension. Can we identify a mechanism for such new physical channel? And we think yes, and these are black holes after structure starts forming. And so similar arguments that led to the calculation of lambda from diffusion at the electroweak transition suggest that black holes could lose rotational energy due to diffusion. And we have about 30% of the rest mass of black holes that could be pumped into the cosmological constant. So this is a lot of energy. And these numbers are compatible with the omega matter equal to 0 0.26 that we find in this very simple, simplistic models I just show you. And another side a comment of this is that this would explain I mean, if this is confirmed by further observations, the apparent, the apparent uh, 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 implication of the data from gravitational waves that seems to suggest that most of the black hole mergers that that all the black hole of the black hole mergers that we have observed so far are compatible with spinless black holes, primary black holes. So why is it that the black holes have no spin when we expect them to have a lot of spin? from uh, astrophysical uh, for, uh, for, uh, formation models. So if we could understand black hole formation and their abundance as a function of Z, their mass and spin from, from Z, from large Z to today, we could, I think, make uh, the, this last speculative discussion about the possible influence to um, the problem of uh, the H0 tension a much more robust and, and serious um, model. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I think we had some discussion during your talk, and since we are already more or less 10 minutes over time, mm -hmm. I suggest that maybe we can postpone the discussion to the lunch break, uh, the further questions to you, if this okay. would be okay. And now maybe let's move to the last talk of today morning.